Thank you for that kind introduction. <laughs> Let me also express my gratitude for um, your hospitality and the opportunity to uh, spend the day here. Um, an, a university that's clearly looking forward to the future, judging from a number of um, developments and interactions um, that are being set up. Let me also express my gratitude to Novartis, the company, for making this happen. I think it's very important that um, we have the chance um, to exchange ideas scientifically um, between universities, between nations, and I think it's good for the science, it's good for economic development, and ultimately it's good for um, quality of life, improvement quality of life. So thank you very much, and I hope to um, see it continue into the future. My group is involved in a number of activities in organic chemistry. I have a group in organic synthesis, to be precise. Um, I summarize that. I have to make see which one is the. No, that's not it. Uh, oh, here, maybe this one? And now I don't know which one. <laughs> involved in several activities in the area of organic synthesis. And that's shown on the next slide. It includes natural products, total synthesis, catalysis. You probably have to press escape, huh? Oh, okay. So it's just here. Oh, I guess I'd left the slide out. <laughs> so it's involved uh, in natural products, total synthesis, catalysis, catalysis methods development, and um, the exploration of a novel small molecule building blocks, something that we have in common, um, as a potential uh, starting points, scaffolds, peripheral uh, groups that one can use in the drug discovery process. What I've chosen to focus on today, uh, an area that I know is of interest in this department, um, involving uh, methods development and in particular catalytic and antiselective uh, synthesis. Our approach to catalytic uh, synthesis in general is to try to identify novel reactivities that we can then exploit in the synthesis of molecules that have value added to them um, because of a utility as potential building blocks. And I hope to be able to illustrate that to you today. One of the ways in which we identify novel catalysts is to uh, search for unusual donors or ligands. It's rather interesting if I draw your attention. Now, which is the pointer, though? Let's see. No, that's not the pointer. The pointer must be, is there a pointer? If I, um, there is a pointer, maybe this one? No? If you look at the periodic table, which is a very nice one, it's provided um, above my head to the right. Which one is it? <laughs> this is a test, I'm afraid I haven't passed. <laughs> so that, wait, that's forward, okay. Where's the pointer? And the pointer? No, that's forward. Oh, merci beaucoup. <laughs> All right. Not so good at passing these tests. If you look up here, um, there is no metal between iridium and platinum. They're right next to each other. And yet, the ability to be able to decorate either iridium or platinum, or for that matter, any metal, with novel donor sets of ligands allows you to essentially invent a universe of metals, metal complexes and catalysts between those two metals um, that have unique reactivities and unique properties. And that's what we like, that's our approach to development of asymmetric catalysis. Identify novel ligand sets that will get us new reactivity and unexpected results. And that's what I hope to show you today um, involving iridium uh, complexes. In particular, let's see if I've Okay, some years ago, uh, my group, and independently that of Professor uh, Tameo Hayashi in Kyoto, decided to ask the question of whether dyes, olefins, could be considered as ligands, working ligands, in catalytic asymmetric synthesis. And this demanded the synthesis, the preparation, of optically active alkenes, dyes to be more specific, and their exploration as catalysts in a variety of different transformations. Professor Hayashi focused on the use of rhodium dyne complexes and my group focused on the use of iridium. And we published a number of papers in that area. A number of papers, either I'm failing this test or 
the battery is out. Well, sort of. A number of papers in that area, as I show you at the bottom of the slide. That will not be the topic of discussion today. I will instead focus on some more recent developments um, which we've published on over the last year to two years. And I will also mix in some results that are unpublished, um, but will fit in nicely with the overall um, theme of the talk, which is to show you how you can get unusual reactivity and thereby access to useful building blocks um, through the use of um, some rather unusual iridium catalysts. So the talk today will focus, ah, okay, this should have been the previous slide. Uh, my group, as I said, focus on a number of different areas. Um, and what I want to particularly focus on today is um, catalysis, and in particular, iridium. All right, let's see if we can get back on track. So the theme that I want to discuss today involves our idea about three, four years ago of uh, morphing or evolving the homoleptic chiral dyeing ligands into heteroleptic ligands and asking the question of whether we, if we mix an olefin donor with a heteroatom donor, phosphorus or nitrogen for example, to get the corresponding heteroleptic ligand shown at the far right, whether one might be able to get some unusual reactivity and therefore generate an interesting set of transformations that are otherwise not possible um, with um, iridium. And as you'll see in a moment, specifically, allyl iridium complexes. First, a little bit of background. I show you here some of the developments that caught our interest um, and compelled us to work in this area. The first two examples were reported in 1997, the very top one by Takeuchi in Japan and the middle one by Helmchen. Um, and they made the interesting observation that one can do allylic substitution reactions with iridium. Uh, but unlike uh, palladium, iridium tends to give a very high branch to linear ratio. Moreover, unlike palladium, the reactions tend to be very convenient to execute. Um, and um, the Takeuchi example at the very top explores the use of phosphites as ligands, while the work of Professor Helmchen um, explored the use of PN type donors. This type of chemistry has been picked up by John Hartwig at uh, University of California at Berkeley in the bottom most example. Uh, some very nice chemistry that he's developed involving the displacement reaction of activated allylic electrophiles with um, amine uh, nucleophiles. Thank you. Let's see if this one works now. <laughs> if, if, if you want just half a minute break or like a few seconds of break, we can switch to this complete and that's so you can switch slides and... and uh, uh, okay. And if, right. if you don't mind. Yeah, well, I'll keep talking. So that's a little bit of background. Note that in all cases, uh, one uses activated allylic species, like what is done in palladium, in the form here of acetates um, and carbonates. And that's become pretty standard, regardless of the catalyst that one utilizes uh, in this area. The idea that one must use an activated species and not the alcohol itself. The first two examples illustrate also a fairly standard nucleophile in the, in the use of uh, allylic displacement reactions, namely malinates, uh, way up here. And in particular, the corresponding soft enolates derived from those malinates. And John Hartwig, most recently, has used amines um, and some alkoxides as nucleophiles to do the allylic displacement uh, reactions. There's a nice review uh, that I cite at the very bottom um, of this slide. So maybe now, okay, let me try the other one. Now, neither works. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, this one is working. Yours is working, Alexei. So, um, the use of activated um, electrophiles in the forms of acetates of car or carbonates. Okay, let me now introduce over the next few slides a background work that we had published uh, some three or four years ago that won't be the focus of this talk, but serve to illustrate uh, what we were thinking as we were developing the chemistry initially. And this was a key result um, that we uh, made, uh, primarily the work of um, Marc Lafrance, who was a postdoc, a Canadian postdoc in my group and is currently employed um, by Novartis. Uh, we discovered that uh, the use of this unusual ligand, which is a phosphoramidite with an olefin donor and iridium, I'll show you a crystal structure of that complex in a moment, the combination of those two components generates a very unique catalyst and one that can use an alcohol directly 
in the substitution reactions with sulfamic acid to give rise to the optically active uh, primary amines. Um, this proceeds over the course of 24 hours at room temperature. It's quite a stable uh, situation. You need not exclude moisture or oxygen for this reaction um, to work well. So there are a number of novelties. I will underscore once again the use of the alcohol. In this particular case, a racemic mixture of alcohols that wherein both of the uh, enantiomers end up at the amine a product. And the use of sulfamic acid as an ammonia equivalent. I mentioned by way of background the work of Hartwig, who had used a variety of different amines in the displacement reaction. But this represented the opportunity, a convenient opportunity for introduction of an unprotected amine, and thereby gives one greater flexibility in one, what, what one does with the corresponding building blocks. This is the kind of react these are the kinds of reactions that you can use. This is an example now, while I showed you on the previous slide an enantioselective synthesis, this is an example of the enantiospecific counterpart. In the previous slide, uh, we had used the chloride complexes. In this particular slide, I show you how the use of lithium iodide, which converts the iridium chloride into the iridium iodide, allows you to do the substitutions of the optically active alcohols directly to the optically active amines. And as the numbers at the bottom of these substrates indicate, uh, the enantiospecificity, or the fidelity, with which the optical activity of the starting material is converted into the optical activity of the product um, is very, very high. Again, I will, these, this is only meant as background. These two slides used to be an hour-long talk in their own right. Um, but I want to just provide a flavor of what we had been doing prior to the work that I will focus on uh, in just a moment. When we make discoveries, as I highlighted in the previous two slides, one of the things that we do in parallel is to carry out mechanistic investigations. And we were curious, in each of those cases, why it was that the alcohol themselves could participate in the displacement of reaction. And I summarize on this slide uh, work from spectroscopic studies, specifically NMR work that we carried out, to try to get some insight into the activation mode of these alcohols. And it turns out that there is precedence for the fact that the dimethylformamide, which is the solvent that we had utilized in the reaction, reacts with sulfamic acid to give this uh, intermediate. This is nothing more than the anhydride between sulfuric acid and DMF. You're probably more familiar with the reagent that corresponds to the anhydride of hydrochloric acid and DMF, known as Vilsmeyer's reagent. Um, and this species, we believe, is largely responsible for the activation of the alcohol to give rise to this um, activated species. We believe then that is uh, intercepted by the corresponding iridium complex to give rise to an allyl iridium intermediate that undergoes trapping by the ammonia that is released from the activation event to give rise to the uh, amine hydrosulfate. Uh, the reaction, when carried out with a ligand altogether um, lacking the olefin, where that olefin has been reduced, doesn't proceed at all. At best, you can get 1 or 2 percent yields, underscoring the importance of that olefin. And we've done some spectroscopic as well as computational work to try to get at the heart of why this ligand is so special. But that's a subject of another talk, and I want to focus today instead on the preparative chemistry that we've developed uh, following up um, on this uh, novel ligand involving the phosphoramide olefin complex. I should point out that one um, mechanistic aspect that we could never rule out um, was the possibility that some of these reactions were occurring via Bronsted acid uh, catalysis. After all, sulfamic acid is an acid, as the name would suggest, and that would uh, indicate that perhaps uh, there may be minor pathways, as I show on the next slide, um, involving activation of the alcohol through protonation by uh, sulfamic acid. We were fairly comp competent and confident that the majority of the reaction was proceeding by way of the DMF activation, as I illustrated on the previous slide. But in thinking about alternative um, activation modes, uh, we decided to pursue this uh, particular feature of Bronsted acid activation in a bit more depth and examine the opportunities that uh, would be enabled. Okay. That led to, just a few more background slides, uh, three reactions that I'll uh, present to you before getting into the new reactions. In thinking along these lines of using Bronsted acid activation of the alcohols, we were able to develop an etherification reaction, 
whereby a racemic mixture of alcohols in the presence of an excess of a second alcohol, typically this would be methyl, ethyl alcohol, trifluoroethyl or benzyl alcohol, uh, with a Bronsted acid activator now, or a dual catalyst, in the presence of a catalyst developed from iridium and the phosphoramide olefin ligand, enables us to access these unsymmetrical ethers, it's a Williamson ether synthesis of sorts, in good yields, excellent antiselectivity, as single regioisomers as is typical for uh, iridium. And that subsequent led us to the identification of a thioetherification reaction, wherein the alcohol with the thio, uh, again the combination of a phosphoramide olef olefin ligand and iridium, this time with a dibutophosphoric acid as the activator, leads to the unsymmetrical uh, thiol ethers, good selectivities, good um, branch to linear ratios, and um, high um, EE. There's some mechanistic intricacies here that I won't have a chance to discuss today, uh, but this basically serves as a starting point, as the launching point for the new chemistry that I will share with you um, today. Let me finish up with some um, minutia concerning the catalyst that I'll be discussing today versus uh, what might appear to be a similar catalyst uh, that John Hartwig has been working with in the literature. So John Hartwig has been working with a catalyst that's derived from iridium cod chloride and the Feringa type phosphoramidites. What he's noted is that there's an activation step that takes place uh, that generates the catalyst itself. And the catalyst itself, as I illustrate pictorially on the right, consists of a complex that includes an iridium carbon sigma bond. And that is generated uh, in the initial stages of the reaction when you're uh, treating it with an amine to generate the corresponding amine hydrochloride. I highlight this fact because this reaction is reversible. So that um, when you have too much acid, Bronsted acid, uh, in these reactions, you convert the iridium carbon sigma bonded complex into the corresponding iridium phosphoramide, and these are inactive. And John Hartwig has done a very, uh, uh, many very nice reactions with these catalysts, but that represents a limitation in our minds because the previous three reactions that I've illustrated to you are possible because of the opportunity to be able to use dual Bronsted acid catalysis in the presence of the iridium. Uh, I show you at the bottom the catalyst that will be the focus of today's talk. It is derived from iridium cod chloride and two equivalents of a phosphoramidite uh, olefin donor. And it will either be the chloride or the iodide. In this talk, it'll be mostly the chloride. These are quite stable to both acid, base, and oxygen, as well as moisture. Uh, indeed, these can be purified by chromatography on silica gel. And I'll show you a crystal structure of this complex um, on the far right. So that's it by way of introduction. Let me now show you some recent work that follows up uh, on the work that I've briefly summarized. The idea that one might be able to use dual Bronsted acid catalysis to expand the scope of nucleophiles that can be used to intercept the allyl iridium uh, intermediate, and thereby expand the scope of building blocks that can be accessed using this chemistry, precisely because of the unique aspects that this catalyst can tolerate uh, Bronsted, and as you'll see in a moment, all sorts of Lewis acids as dual uh, catalysts. So the first set of new reactions that I want to share with you involves uh, the use of organoboron type um, nucleophiles. This was very attracted to us because organoboron, thanks to the work of um, um, Suzuki and many others, um, are convenient building blocks that are readily accessible and easily accessed. And so we felt that there would be a lot of opportunities if we could develop the allylic displacement chemistry with um, organoboron type intermediates, which to my surprise had not been extensively, uh, if at all, examined um, in the literature. So the first uh, slide and work that I want to show you that does now represent the focus of today involves the use of the iridium phosphoramidite olefin complex, which is generated in situ simply by mixing iridium cod chloride with the phosphoramidite olefin ligand, the racemic allylic alcohols, and the vinyl trifluoroborates. These are reagents that have been popularized by uh, Jean-Pierre Genet initially, and subsequently by uh, Gary Molander at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, what we use in this particular reaction is the hydrosulfate as a Bronsted acid dual catalyst that serves to activate the allylic alcohol. And in the early developments of this process, we employed hydrogen fluoride. And 
what is critical there is the fluoride, which reacts with the released BF3. If you were to balance this equation, you realize that BF3 is formed. And the addition of hydrogen fluoride ensures that the BF3 is converted to the tetrafluoroborate salt. And that ends up being quite important for the efficiency of the process. As you can see here, we get the 1,4 adines for um, a wide range of uh, substrates and their additional ones in the publication. Uh, and all are routinely formed in high enantioselectivity, uh, good yields, and very high levels of uh, branch to linear ratios as indicated in the numbers uh, in the parentheses. And this represented the first example of the use of organoboron in the allylic substitution reactions. I show you some additional examples here that involve variation of the vinyl uh, trifluoroborate. Uh, you can see in these two examples that both the trans trifluoroborate and the cis trifluoroborate can be made to work and that the reactions are stereospecific with respect to the uh, trifluoroborate, such as the trans trifluoroborate ends up as a trans product, and the cis trifluoroborate ends up as a cis product um, without any isomerization in the course of events. And a host of different, um, rather useful vinyl trifluoroborates uh, can be engaged in the process to give rise to some unusual building blocks. On the next slide, I show you how we've extended this to include the alkyno trifluoroborates. On the left, you see that um, a wide range of um, allyl fragments can be employed and intercepted by um, the corresponding, uh, I believe this is the methyl trifluoroborate, to give rise to products of these types, these enines, in high optical purity, high branch to linear ratios, and um, good, useful uh, yields. The reaction conditions are similar to what I described uh, just a few seconds ago. It involves taking the iridium cod chloride with the phosphoramidide olefin uh, ligand. Once again, if you reduce the olefin in these processes and use the simple uh, phosphoramidide, the reaction doesn't work at all. So there's something unique to the olefin as a ligand, and indeed having to do with the fact that it's a good pi donor and pi acceptor that leads to the properties of this metal to be able to catalyze this reaction. The Bronsted acid that's used to activate the alcohol as a dual catalyst is the trifluoroacetic acid shown in the middle here. And at this point in reaction development, um, my student wanted to get away from HF. And what he discovered is that the use of the potassium hydrogen fluoride salt, which is more convenient to handle than hydrofluoric acid, serves the function of trapping the released BF3 to give the corresponding tetrafluoroborate um, salts. On the right, what you see is that a whole range of different alkynes are engaged in this reaction, again giving products uh, with useful metrics in terms of yields, selectivities, and um, regio and enantioselectivity. Take note of the fact that even some unusual functional groups are quite tolerated in the process. Primary chloride here is completely unaffected, and aldehydes, esters, for example, are uh, iodides, bromides, are again left untouched um, in the process. Now, um, we've only recently, relatively speaking, entered into the area of allyl metal chemistry, say for the last 10 or 11 years. So as I began to work in this area and my students produced these kinds of results, um, we needed to educate ourselves as to what one could use these building blocks in. How would they enable certain kinds of uh, complex or not so complex synthesis. And so what I want to show you is how in each and every case where we develop reaction chemistry, such as the last two that I've presented to you, we look to establish implementation of those methods in some interesting target-oriented uh, syntheses. First, a very simple and straightforward uh, implementation in the context of two natural products that are plant metabolites. These have some interesting biological activity in terms of um, antioxidant activity. This was the work of an undergraduate in my group. We were able to show that these allylic alcohols can be converted into the corresponding 1,4 dynes, as I illustrated earlier, in good yields and good enantioselectivities. And these, in turn, after deprotection, give directly uh, rise to the natural product. So overall, about two steps. Um, to provide these um, useful natural products. The reactions, as you can see, are convenient to run. No need to use nitrogen or argon atmosphere. Uh, no need to exclude the moisture that is in the atmosphere. 
Um, and so these represent uh, sort of convenient alternatives to some of the other allylic displacement processes that are in the literature. In the next slide, I show you an even more complex application. And that involves access to a molecule that's been developed at Amgen as a GPR40 agonist. Uh, our approach to the, our second approach to the synthesis of this molecule is shown in the box. Um, we take the allylic alcohol, the alkynyl trifluoroborate, conditions that I've described previously, trifluoroacetic acid being the Bronsted acid co dual catalyst. That gives rise to the C9. And because the chemistry of an alkyne is very different from the chemistry of an olefin, we can selectively functionalize the olefin, in this particular case, by uh, hydroboration and oxidation. And that ultimately gives rise to the beta substituted, the alkynyl substituted uh, propanoic acid uh, in the box. So it's a short synthesis to illustrate the utility of the uranium chemistry. What I find particularly interesting about this chemistry, as someone who's interested in synthetic strategy to complex structures, is the fact that it opens up new opportunities for thinking about retrosynthesis and in turn implementing uh, new sequences in the synthetic direction. You see, when you look at this molecule here, I think most individuals uh, that are synthetic chemists and even non-synthetic chemists, most students of chemistry, when asked to think about how to make this substructure, would imagine carrying out some sort of conjugate addition, disconnection of this bond, conjugate addition to an unsaturated ester or an unsaturated malinate. That would be sort of a standard uh, way of disconnecting the structure. And that's the way that it's been made. Huh? We've done it in our lab, as I summarize it on this slide. The idea that you take a Michael acceptor, in this case derived from um, Meldrum's acid, and an alkyne and carry out a conjugate addition reaction. You see, subsequent to that addition reaction, you can do a hydrolysis and decarboxylation and thereby access the alkynyl acid. This is actually worked by a student of mine, uh, Tomas Knopfel, who is also employed uh, at Novartis at present. And it's a strategy that's been produced by workers at Amgen, Margaret Fall, um, in uh, Thousand Oaks, California, has shown that the corresponding alkynyl zinc reagents can be made to add um, with an appropriate uh, amino alcohol ligand uh, to give the products in high selectivities. So this would be the standard disconnection. As I showed you in the previous slide, the iridium chemistry opens up new opportunities uh, and possibility of accessing different kinds of substituted versions of these alkynyl acids than would be possible with the standard disconnection. Okay, let me go on to ask another question. Uh, of course, you can imagine there are questions, other questions that you can continue to deal with um, uh, regarding uh, organoboron, right? Can you use boronic acids? Can you use vinyl silanes? Can you use vinyl zincs? And those are questions that we're continuing to pursue. But instead, I want to show you a different direction that we've taken, um, and that's to ask the question about the use of other nucleophiles. And I'll spend the next 10 or 15 minutes, possibly 20 even, uh, discussing the use of other uh, nucleophiles. In particular, what I show you on this slide is the use of electron-rich arenes um, and heterenes uh, as nucleophiles. So the idea that's pursued in this work, which is unpublished, is inspired in part by work that's been uh, published by Shu Li Yu at the Shanghai Institute of Organic Chemistry, which I highlight at the bottom of the slide. In this particular case, we're generating an allyl iridium species under standard conditions, mixing in situ the iridium cod chloride with the phosphoramidide olefin ligand. It turns out that in this particular case, we're activating the alcohol with a Lewis acid, zinc-2. And then what we were investigating was whether the allyl iridium species that is generated can be intercepted by an electron-rich arene. And as you can gather from this slide, the answer to that is yes. You can use electron-rich benzene rings, as well as furans, pyroles that are either substituted with Bach. Uh, Tossel is not in this uh, slide, but um, you can find some, we will be publishing some examples uh, shortly. Um, and indoles, both substituted with NBOC protecting groups and uh, um, benzene sulfonyl uh, amides. Once again, as is characteristic of the chemistry that I'm disclosing to you uh, today, the selectivities in these reactions are very high, both regioselectivity and enantioselectivity, and the yields are quite good. And as you can imagine, some of these uh, at the bottom begin to look like subunits that are found in a number of different bioactive uh, natural products. And indeed, we're looking to implement this in some complex molecule synthesis. 
Let me go on with uh, pursuing that question, expanding the scope of the reaction, in particular as it relates to carbon type nucleophiles. And the question that I want to discuss over the next few minutes um, involves the idea of coupling the arene trapping event uh, with an intermediate step where you ask the question of whether an olefin can trap the initial allyl iridium species, say forming that carbon-carbon bond, and in turn the new carbocation is trapped by an electron-rich uh, arene. So we're increasing the level of complexity, the number of steps, number of carbon-carbon bonds, and stereogenic centers that are potentially accessible in the products that are generated. So I show you that on this slide. The substrates are fairly straightforward. We have an allyl alcohol as the initiator of the uh, cation cyclization event. We have an olefin that is occurring between the initiating event and the arene. Uh, the conditions are fairly standard at this point, iridium cod chloride and the phosphoramidide ligand with a Lewis acid in a form of zinc-2 to serve to activate the allyl alcohol. As you can see here, the products are generated with high selectivity and in good yields. And uh, these products, uh, once again, uh, are suggestive of certain substructures that are found in some um, rather complex natural products with some interesting uh, uh, anti-cancer type pro properties. Okay. What I've shown you with that uh, example is that olefins perhaps can serve as uh, trapping agents for these uh, allyl iridium uh, intermediates. And that led us to think about using olefins without having to resort to the use of boronic acids or trifluoroborates as nucleophiles. And I want to share with you next um, the, this idea um, wherein we looked to see if we could identify uh, allyl iridium intermediates and the corresponding olefins and thereby generate the 1,5 optically active dying uh, type uh, building blocks. There's some precedence for this area, albeit with allyl metal as nucleophiles. Uh, ben Feringa has used um, allyl grignards, intercepted the corresponding allyl bromide with a range of different optically active uh, copper complexes. And um, Morkin at the Boston College has carried out related chemistry with allylic carbonates and palladium and uh, allyl boron type of nucleophiles. While we, are, while we are pursuing allyl boron and allyl grignard in uh, related processes, um, we wanted to investigate whether we could use the olefins themselves. And very recently, this just appeared this year in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, we've been able to show that indeed 1,1 disubstituted olefins can be used in these reactions. Uh, you get the corresponding 1,5 dienes now, um, in good yields, um, good selectivities, good regio control. This time, the preferred promoter is a bron Bronsted acid, shown here in this box, as the bis uh, sulfonamide. We have a standard set of promoters these days, Bronsted acids that span a wide range of PKAs, and Lewis acids, zinc, uh, boron, indium, um, are some of the common ones, magnesium. And we simply do a screening of those Bronsted acids. They all more or less work, or Lewis acids, but we do a screening to optimize any particular transformation. You gotta imagine that we're dealing with multiple steps, right? There is an activation event, there's a generation of the allyl iridium species, there is the reaction of the nucleophile with the allyl iridium species, and the turnover event to generate a second allyl iridium species. And I think the selection of any one Bronsted acid or Lewis acid is optimal in that it doesn't interfere with any one step and keeps all of the intermediates at essentially similar energy so that the reaction doesn't get to bog down um, in a particular uh, step. So um, that's how we identified this particular uh, Bronsted acid. I show you on the next slide uh, some additional double bonds, uh, olefins, that participate in the reaction. And at this point, take note of the fact that it is exclusively 1,1 disubstituted double bonds. This is reminiscent of the reactivity that you see in carbonyl ene reactions, where typically the best kinds of alkenes that function in the carbonyl ene reaction is the 1,1 substituted olefins. They possess enough nucleophilicity by virtue of the substitution without too much steric hindrance that leads to uh, good product um, forming rates. But even with that limitation, you can see from this slide that there are quite a range of olefins that can be engaged in this process. 
uh, methylene cyclopentan and cyclohexane, uh, isobutylene itself uh, will participate in the process. And you can couple in a number of other typical um, intermediates and rearrangements that occur uh, from cations uh, to give rise to some unusual structures, such as the one in the bottom of the slide at the far right, at 99% DE, 83% DO, and 20 to 1 um, ratio. This is work, again, that um, appeared um, earlier this year. Now, what you'll note in this particular work uh, are a number of things which will serve as inspiration to develop the uh, reaction chemistry further. At this point, we were beginning to see some examples where we were seeing mixtures of products that correspond to the olefin not only just occurring here, that would be the 3 or the 2 or the 1.5, but in certain cases, the olefin is occurring here or here. Um, and that, of course, has to do with the fact that the cation um, is, has a finite lifetime, a long-lived lifetime, and will choose to undergo elimination to give you the various different kinds uh, of olefins. It's probably also due to the fact that some of these products, dyes, for example, uh, can undergo protonation readily and isomerization. And I highlight that because we wanted to see whether we could fix that. And I'll show you how we fix it in just a moment. Huh? Here's another example. Again, not being used to these kinds of building blocks, I challenged my student to think about what these would be good for. Um, and what I show you here is the application to the synthesis of a Johnson & Johnson compound, this time a gamma-secretase gamma um, inhibitor. And what um, uh, James Hamilton was able to show was that you could take the allylic alcohols, a balloon of isobutylene, under the conditions shown here. So it is the iridium cod chloride phosphoramidite ligand. The promoter in chloroform gives you the corresponding 1,5 diene in good selectivities, useful yields, and excellent regio control. These are useful because it turns out that the 1, 1 substituted olefin and the mono substituted olefin have orthogonal reactivities. I show you here that one can in fact uh, carry out selective ionic reduction of the one more nucleophilic 1, 1 substituted olefin and thereby acts as the isopropylidine or isobutyl group that you need in the natural product. The mono substituted olefin can then be subjected to oxidative cleavage to give rise to the acid. So this is an example, again, that I find rather interesting. As someone interested in strategy and complex molecule synthesis, I think it's fair to say that if I presented this in an exam, most people, or in a discussion session, most people would think of making this molecule through an enolate alkylation of the corresponding ester enolate. Um, this might be an Evans auxiliary, for example, and the corresponding isobutyl um, iodide. I think uh, a number of people might also suggest a reduction of the unsaturated acid um, as an opportunity for using asymmetric catalysis, the beautiful work of Noyori and others um, in this area. The ability, the ability to be able to use allyl iridium chemistry combined uh, affords you a completely different pathway to access these kinds of uh, structures. Okay, I highlighted two slides ago that there were some limitations, um, that these uh, needed to be um, 1,1 one, one, or 2,2 two, two disubstituted olefins of this type, and that in certain cases, one observed competitive deprotonation or isomerization of the olefin, so that you not only uh, obtain the 1,5 diene, but also the isomerized uh, versions. That's a limitation in certain cases, not all, but we wanted to see if we could focus on that as an opportunity to identify um, other olefins that might participate in this reaction without the attendant uh, complications or limitations. And um, what we decided to explore at this point was the use of an allyl silane. Um, these olefins, despite the fact that they're monosubstituted, are more nucleophilic by virtue of the donation by the allyl silicon bond into the bi pi star of the double bond. And moreover, silicon, as an electrofuge, uh, would nicely serve to dictate um, where the olefin ends up without the opportunity, um, at least out of the cation, to generate the corresponding isomerized um, olefin. And that um, is unpublished work um, that I actually have a manuscript with me that I need to work on. 
Um, and is shown, the results of which are shown on this and the next slide. What we found is that indeed you can take a range of allylic alcohols, the racemic allylic alcohols, with a slight excess of allyl silane, which is commercially available. Standard conditions, it's scandium this time, that's the optimal Lewis acid, to give rise to the same kinds of building blocks that I showed you before, 1,5-dienes. And these are formed in very high in antiselectivity and um, in good yields. So this uh, addresses the limitation that I had pointed out before, um, that you could only access the cor corresponding products derived from the 1-1 one, one or the 2-2 two, two disubstituted olefins. I show you on the right here, well, I guess as well as on the left, a broad range of allyl silanes that will participate in this reaction, including those that are substituted with electron withdrawing groups such as acetates and chlorides, all work quite well. The reaction is tolerant of a free alcohol, vinyl halides, and uh, protected amines. And you can even use uh, dienyl-type uh, silanes uh, to give rise to some interesting building blocks. I draw your attention to the two on the left here, because if you were to use palladium with these kinds of um, species, what you would get is the trimethylene methane intermediate. And that has very different chemistry. That doesn't do allylic displacement chemistry. That does cycloadditions with olefins to give rise to the corresponding methylene cyclopentanes. So this provides complementary reactivity to what you would otherwise observe uh, with palladium. Now once again, you look at the products. I spent some time a few minutes ago telling you how 1,1 disubstituted olefins have very different reactivity from monosubstituted olefins. And that's what makes those products potentially quite useful. When you look at this, you have to ask the question, um, when you're generating products like this, can you differentiate those two olefins? And um, my very talented student in this group, um, James Hamilton, um, with an undergraduate, Nicole Hauser, has indeed shown that you can differentiate those two olefins. So I show you now an application to the synthesis of an insecticide. I believe this is a Syngenta product. And what I show you is how you can take the racemic allylic alcohols here, intercept the species with allosilane to give rise to the 1,5-olefin. Uh, uh, and what um, James uh, noted is that, in fact, these two have very different, subtly different reactivities, the beta branching point being at the allylic position for this olefin and at the homoallylic position for the other olefin makes them sterically a little different, and electronically, no doubt different enough that you can carry out a selective hydroboration of this olefin highlighted in red. That allows you then to do a Suzuki, alkyl Suzuki type coupling that's work that's been done a lot by Greg Fu now at the California Institute of Technology to generate these kinds of building blocks. Subsequent work then involves a carrying out a cyclopropanation reaction of the olefin. These are conditions that have been developed by um, Yian Shi at Colorado State University. Um, to give rise to the cyclopropyl unit. Again, when looking at this kind of molecule, I don't think anybody would think of allylation chemistry as a way to access these kinds of structures. And so the use of iridium chemistry really does enable new routes uh, that may be important for IP purposes. It may also important, be important in terms of the generation of uh, diversity that you wouldn't otherwise be able to use uh, because of other routes having certain limitations. Okay. Let me move on to a different issue. I've shown you at this point how olefins can be made to participate in these processes, including um, allosilanes, and if you want to think of an electron-rich arene as an olefin, electron-rich arenes as well. This naturally led to the formulation of a question in which we were wondering whether we could set up polycationic cyclizations that would mimic biosynthetic pathways. And this is work that's ongoing in the group, but I want to show you one example that we've recently published in this area. And that involves the synthesis of lab name type uh, diterpenoids. These are diterpenoids that have been studied extensively um, in terms of the biosynthesis. It's largely believed that the geranyl geranyl diphosphate, through the intervention of a class II cyclase, gives rise to these complicated structures. So we naturally wondered if we could use these allylic alcohols to set up a cyclization pathway highlighted in the middle here that would give rise to the same kinds of diterpenoid um, substituted decalins. What we needed to identify in this case, however, was an X that's equivalent to the H that would serve to terminate the cyclization event in this particular case. 
um, so that it wouldn't proceed any further. Now, it wasn't obvious what that X should be at the outset, but of course, given that I just presented to you Al Silanes uh, in this reaction, we subsequently discovered that Silane was the ideal uh, electrofuge to be able to do these biomimetics equalizations. So what I want to show you is how we've used that with a spiraline. Um, in fact, I'll just go right to the key reaction. Uh, we can generate this uh, trying with an alcy lane strategically positioned, and that will undergo a cyclization event to give rise to the substituted decalin with uh, four new stereogenic centers. This is forming good diastereomeric ratios, good uh, enantio control, and good regio control, as you might expect from a cyclization reaction. This was then taken on in a handful of steps to corresponding natural product of spirulite uh, C. Okay, let me finish up with uh, uh, yet another um, sort of perspective on these reactions. What I've shown you up to now is how we've expanded the kinds of nucleophiles that can be used to intercept the putative um, allyl iridium intermediate to include boronic acids as the trifluoroborates, olefins, allosilanes, arenes. And in a sense, those expand the kinds of complex building blocks that you can access uh, through the use of this chemistry. We next set out to ask the question whether we could increase complexity by purposefully generating a, a second stereogenic center that would come from the nucleophile uh, fragment. We've done that a little bit in the cyclization reaction since we're generating stereogenic centers that arise from the olefin um, or the arene. But we wanted to see if we could expand this in a more general sense and in particular, we were attracted by developing a new concept that I'll discuss over the course of the next few slides. If I ask you to make a compound C with two stereogenic centers, where there are four stereoisomers possible, two enantiomers and uh, two diastereomeric pairs, um, and I ask you to generate a particular compound with a specific configuration, most people in the audience would uh, identify their favorite catalyst, bio, metallo, or organo, um, and come back with a solution to access some compound C. If I then change my mind and ask you to make the enantiomeric compound, well, that's pretty easy today. Most uh, metallo, uh, organo, and even bio catalysts have a corresponding um, ent catalyst. In the bio, it wouldn't be exactly ent, but it would, there are possibilities there as well to give rise the enantiomeric product. So that's relatively easy today to do. You know, just a matter of uh, how you choose to disconnect the molecule and what kinds of catalysts are your favorite. However, if at this point I come back and ask you to make the diastereomers of those same two compounds, that's where you would have some difficulties. Because the catalysts that have may, may have been developed to carry out an antiselective synthesis are highly specific for a configurational arrangement in the product. And when accessing the diastereomers, they are typically inaccessible. What you would have to do is identify a different catalyst, a different disconnection altogether to access a diastereomer. So that led us uh, to an interesting thought that perhaps it would be interesting to develop catalytic processes that would be allowing you to access all uh, stereoisomers of a particular product. It turns out that that has a name that I'll discuss in just a moment. Let me give you a specific example. A very modern example. If these two products, they're aldol addicts, are the target of your synthesis, you can either use this enantiomer of proline or its cognate antipode and access either of the two anti-type aldol products. Those are formed in good yields and in good selectivities. You can't use that same chemistry to generate the syn aldol addicts. You have to go to a different chemistry altogether. Uh, in this particular case, you would have to go to some titanium Lewis acids that have been developed to do synaldols, or you would have to do Evans-type uh, aldol chemistry. Okay, what I'm hinting at here conceptually is the development of stereodivergent processes. Stereodivergency is defined as the process by which one provides access to all possible stereoisomers of a given product. If it's a product with two stereogenic centers, there are four products. And you do that through the use of only two catalysts, catalysts one and two, and some sim simple permutation of the combinations of those two catalysts um, that you use. That's a concept of stereodivergency which is unexplored uh, up until the work that I'll show you in just a moment. Now, one way of thinking about generating stereodivergent processes is to do dual catalysis. 
namely have one catalyst interacting with one component and a second catalyst interacting with the other component so that you can independently steer the course of the reaction through each of the reactants and that gives rise to a product and you can see how the combination of dual catalysis of stereodivergency might provide access to fully stereodivergent type processes okay it might not surprise you that we choose to use an allyl iridium um, as one of the components since I've shown you throughout the talk how iridium is very good at controlling the stereochemistry of the allyl products that are formed we chose to focus on amine catalyst and aldehyde um, as the other component because there's a, been a lot of work that's been uh, carried out involving enamine type intermediates with aldol and shift base additions, Michael additions and we felt we might be able to combine these two components to generate these products in a fully stereodivergent manner. I want to show you some leading experiments that we did in this area this will be our two test substrates or reactants, the substituted aldehyde and the allyl alcohol. Um, we wanted to use the iridium phosphoramidide olefin complexes and I'll show you here how we in the initial screening results use the optically active phosphoramidide olefin complex and the A chiral complex just to get the mechanistic insight. And we're combining an aldehyde with either an optically active amine or the A chiral amine and analyzing very carefully the products that we got out of this reaction. In the first experiment, we used the optically active phosphoramidide olefin ligand and the iridium complex with the a chiralamine. And this is the result that we get. We get a mixture of products, and each of those products are formed in 99% TE. When you analyze those products carefully, you realize that the 99% TE uh, results from beta control. And that is, after all, the iridium doing its job and doing its well. As you've seen throughout the talk, iridium is very good at controlling the uh, configuration of the allylic stereo center. The DR that is poor in this particular case is coming out of the fact that the a amine has no particular bias. The second experiment is a cognate experiment where we use an optically active amine because we're looking at a disubstituted acetaldehyde, we have to use a primary amine, as is known in the organocatalysis literature. And we get this result, more or less the same sort of mediocre DR, um, the same yield. When you analyze each of each components, 68% DE and 92% DE, and one way of thinking about this is that the amine, the chiral amine, is very good at exercising alpha control. Since the iridium species is achiral, there is little or no control with respect to the beta center. The next experiment is simply to be complete in the mechanistic analysis. The a chiral components give rise to a 3 to 1 dr, which is not too different from this, and in reality not too different from the 1.3 to 1. The final experiment involves um, the optically active phosphoramidide olefin complex and the optically active primary amine. You can see that we get excellent drs, excellent ee, and that means that this time the iridium is doing its job well, good beta control, and the amine is doing its job well, good alpha control, and that's why we're seeing the, this result um, and this result uh, for each of those components. Now this is not a stereodivergent reaction yet, I haven't shown you that, but it's a highly diastereoselective process to access products that you can think of in the traditional sense as Claisen type products. Right in the classic language of retrosynthetic analysis, the keying element or the retron in the products is the olefin and the carbonyl, alpha, beta, gamma, alkenyl, aldehyde is suggestive of a clasin. You might think of making these via clasin, but you won't get them in optically active form. You would get them as racemates. This provides another entry into these products, as I show you here. It turns out it's a general process. Um, one can use many different kinds of allyl alcohols. Uh, as I'll show you on the next slide, many different kinds of aldehydes. The combination of these two components gives you the product in good selectivity, good yield, and good regio control. Additional examples are shown um, here. Again, it's not a stereodivergent at this point process. It's just a diastereoselective process. But in this slide, I show you how it is a stereodivergent as well. Um, what I've shown you here is that you can take the same two sets of starting materials, the same um, catalysts, and all that I'm varying here is whether I use one enantiomer of the phosphoramidite or the other in combination with one enantiomer of the amine or its pseudo enantiomer. Since this is a cinchona based uh, organocatalyst, you have the classic problem that the two enantiomers per se aren't available. 
but um, they are pseudo enantiomers. They're almost enantiomers um, and provide the same function. And as you can see, you can generate all of the four possible products in um, excellent EEs throughout and excellent DRs, which is consistent with a fully diastereodivergent process, both an antidivergent and a diastereodivergent, so fully stereodivergent. I'll show you some additional examples, and in the paper we have yet more uh, that are consistent with this being general. You can see that all we're doing here at the top is permuting the combination of one catalyst with another, and that gives rise to all four possibilities routinely in high E's, high DR's, and high uh, regio control. Now, you notice that in the reaction that I just presented to you, we were generating products with quaternary centers, huh? here. And a lot of people said, oh, that's great. Uh, that's a very difficult problem that you've solved. It might be. But the reason that we chose these kinds of products are technical. Huh? It turns out that this stereo center, of course, is configurationally stable, and that's good. And the fact that there is sterochindrins here makes these, um, that they, they don't participate in self-condensation type processes. So the reason we reported these first is not because we were particularly attractive to quaternary centers, but rather because uh, these had these favorable features. The more difficult sort of products to make are the ones that would have a methine center alpha because they would be configurationally labile. Um, and because they're configurationally labile as well as sterically less hindered, they are more prone to self-condensation. That was actually a more difficult problem, not the generation of products with quaternary centers. We've recently reported this uh, in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. So monosubstituted acetaldehydes means that we have to use uh, secondary amines, as is known in the literature of organocatalysis. And what I show you here is that combinations of the organocatalyst with the phosphoramidite complex to the iridium gives rise to all of the possible stereoisomeric products in good yields and good selectivities and good regio control. So this is yet an example once again of a stereodivergent, fully stereodivergent process, this time for the synthesis of these kinds of compounds containing uh, methinyl uh, vicinal stereocenters. And it ends up being quite general. We have a number of examples uh, that we're exploring in terms of syntheses, both natural products and pharmaceutical agents uh, to showcase the versatility of the process. Um, but I want to finish up with um, an, uh, the discussion of how we think about these processes and how we think about expanding the concept further to other uh, reactions. I think what makes the reactions that I've just shown you stereodivergent is the fact that you have outer sphere elements coming together. In one, on one hand, you have an allyl iridium complex, and if you remember your elementary organometallic chemistry, the metal binds through an eta-3 arrangement. And that means that one face is fully blocked, and the other face is fully exposed. And the same thing, I think, is happening with the enamine. If you do conformational analysis of the enamine, you realize that one face is blocking, uh, the enamine is blocking one face of that dolefin component, leaving the other face fully exposed. So you ultimately have two uh, flat faces approaching each other. And that's what leads to full stereodivergency. So which set of faces are coming together is a function of which allyl iridium component you're employing and which uh, optically active amine you're using. So I show you again some concepts on this slide. We think that at least when thinking of allyl metal species, the optimal condition arises from having the component as orthogonal as possible uh, to the reacting plane. That leads to high enantial control and leads to minimal crosstalk between the two components. And that's when you get maximal stereodivergency. I think that what you want to do is stay away from components that begin to move these elements towards the plane because then you will have some crosstalk between these two components leading to matching and mismatching. You might have highly stereoselective processes, but they won't necessarily be highly stereodivergent. And so moving forward with this concept, um, we're looking at uh, asking the question beyond iridium, beyond palladium, beyond enamines, can we identify other species that behave in this manner because it's in this ideal situation that we can develop fully stereodivergent 
processes, at least to uh, compounds containing two stereogenic centers. It's much more difficult to think of compounds containing three stereogenic centers or four. I haven't yet figured out how to think about that. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done in this area in terms of developing this chemistry. The last uh, three, four minutes, I want to show you unpublished work um, in developing this further. This time linking it to natural product synthesis because I'm always interested in linking our methods to the to implementation and their implementation in settings where I think they can make a difference beyond the synthetic objectives of the product of the project. That has to do with stereodivergent total synthesis. So I've just discussed stereodivergency in methods development. I want to show you how we're thinking about implementing this in the context of total synthesis. And this is a well-known compound, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, um, which uh, enjoys um, I guess wide usage in one sense of the word, but um, also use um, as a therapeutic agent for the treatment of anorexia, uh, as an anti-nauseant uh, for the treatment of neuropathic pain and uh, spasticity. It turns out um, that its pharmacology remains largely ill-defined and people believe that it is a classic case of polypharmacology, a compound uh, that might be hitting a number of different receptors. What study has been done in this area suggests that they bind primarily to G-coupled receptors CB1 and CB2, but that there are other targets. And that perhaps if one was more selective in which targets one binds to, one would be able to eliminate some of the unwanted effects of tetrahydrocannabinol involving perception and motor impairment or uh, all sorts of other effects, for example, on fertility. So we felt that this was an ideal situation uh, to carry out stereodivergent synthesis of a natural product and develop that concept uh, further. So the idea is that we would have the same set of starting materials in a stereodivergent step would give rise to four building blocks that differ only in the fact that their configurations are permutations of the four possibilities. These would then be taken through an identical sequence of steps to give rise to the four possible diastereomers of a given natural uh, product. If you want to be strict adherent to a stereodivergent synthesis, then there would be no deviation from the main synthetic sequence, um, and you would be using more or less the same conditions uh, in each case, making the process of generating structural diversity considerably simplified. Okay, so that's what I want to show you. And um, I will skip uh, an analysis, a retrosynthetic analysis of tetrahydrocannabinol, but um, we realized that one could carry out this reaction with this allylic alcohol and aldehyde such as this with the iridium phosphoramidide olefin complex and an amine to generate the four uh, permutation of products that I show you on this slide. It's identical set of conditions. The only thing that's varying is whether we use one phosphoramidide or it's an antimer, one amine or it's an antimer. And that's what gives rise to all of these with decent yields, excellent in angio control. It's not fully stereodivergent. It's not as good as some of the other reactions, but 12 to 1 is still pretty good. Each of those products then are taken through the same sequence of reactions involving ring closing metathesis, oxidation of the aldehyde to the acid, um, and subsequent um, the cyclization gives rise, and deprotection, that's what this last step is, gives rise to the various stereoisomers of tetrahydrocannabinol. Now the bond at the bottom has been made before, and I think we can make it better, but that would just be carrying out synthesis in a very classic sense. This one has been made, but in a racemic fashion, and so we can now access it in an antipure form, uh, each of the two enantiomers. And these two diastereomers are unknown, um, but the stereodivergent synthesis allows you to access them and study their pharmacology. And so indeed, we are, um, carrying out such a process as part of a collaboration with the biology group. So the chemistry that I just shown you about, uh, I just talked about, enables a collaboration with the biological group. Where we're interested in studying the cell surface and in particular receptors, and we're interested in using small molecules such as tetrahydrocannabinol um, as tools to explore the landscape of the cell surface. The cell surface, of course, being very important, uh, involved in cell-cell communication, interaction with pathogens, binding of chemical messengers, and so natural products chemistry, synthetic methodology that is used to carry out the syntheses, um, I believe will be able to shed some light on the very complicated 
um, structure that is the biological uh, membrane. And with that, um, I'm going to conclude my talk. Um, I've shown you how we can um, make use of these iridium complexes to do a broad range of chemical transformations uh, with alkynyl trifluoroborates, vinyl trifluoroborates, all sorts of different olefins, including allosilanes, and finally, aldehydes, both disubstituted and monosubstituted acetaldehydes, to give rise to clasin-like uh, products. Importantly, this last process has led us to develop the concept um, involving stereodivergent catalysis that allows you to access all enantio and diastereomers of a particular product by simple permutation of ca two catalysts, catalyst one and catalyst two. That in turn has allowed us to develop, which is an ongoing process, the concept of stereodivergent natural product synthesis, and I showcase that in the context of tetrahydrocannabinol. I thank you for the opportunity to present these results to you. Let me first um, actually acknowledge the various institutions that have funded this and related projects. In particular, the work that I've um, highlighted to you today has been funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation and the um, ETH uh, Zurich. Finally, let me acknowledge the individuals that have worked in this area. Dr. David Sarla is a postdoc that has worked with me um, that has been instrumental in developing the chemistry uh, extensively, uh, as I've discussed with you today, with some of these individuals, they didn't all work in the group at the same time, um, but these six individuals have contributed to the various projects that I either discussed in the introduction or that formed the basis of the talk uh, today. I thank you for the opportunity to present the results and I'll be glad to answer any questions now or as the day uh, progresses at the various opportunities that we will have to discuss science. Thank you. Can I ask what your name is first? Well, substrate as uh, called. Oh, right. my name, my yeah. name is Roman uh, Kudin. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, all these reactions uh, you have used, uh, the aridic alcohol system, yes, for, for these uh, operations and others. So my question is, can uh, the new moiety in this system be replaced by any other aluminum uh, substituent with the, the same uh, so, mm -hmm. so you're asking whether we can use, so I, all of the examples that I had were employing vinyl, something else, carbonyls. And you're asking whether we can substitute um, on the olefin. Um, we have some examples where we can substitute on the olefins, um, but most of the time um, these reactions are limited to the use of the vinyl um, other uh, carbonyls. So it is work that's ongoing. Of course, when you're looking at the substituted olefin, you have a different regioisomeric uh, problem that you have to consider. Uh, this is true in palladium and in iridium and in rhodium. Um, and no one's really solved that problem. We have some indications that it may be possible, but um, at the current level of development, it's vinyl, um, whatever, carbonyls. Yes, I Okay, um, I, I think I put up some examples where we had done it on millimole and then 10 millimoles. Um, I took out a slide, because it was a late night last night, I thought it was going to be more slow today. <laughs> I took out a slide um, where the process has been submitted to organic synthesis. Organic synthesis is um, this um, organization that checks procedures independently in uh, separate academic labs, and they minimally have to be done on five gram scale. So we've done it, a specific example on five gram scale and submitted it for um, checking. So uh, the selectivities are good they retain in this? Yeah, there's no erosion on selectivity. The yields are usually better. Huh? Because in general, we're working with small molecules huh, that have um, some volatility. So the yields 
I think are better on the larger scale because it's easier to handle five grams than it is to handle a hundred milligrams. Huh? Okay, All right, thank you. I'll ask you a question. How far have you listened to it before? Are you allowed? <laughs> <laughs> Just to start the discussion. So, in your on your slides, you you showed already like a great variety of uh, different uh, bronze and uh, Lewis acids to catalyze the reaction. But you always use exactly the same ligands. So, have you ever looked into the maybe electronic steric nature of your ligand? Okay. So, um, yes, we have a we had I had a project of generating diversity in that ligand. There's some obvious places for substitution. And uh, Max Malacrea at um, GIF, in, uh, outside of Paris, has a project, synthetic, purely synthetic methods development, to make these kinds of compounds. And so he, he was also very kind in supplying a variety of substituted systems, which allow us to explore sterics and um, electronics. That's ongoing. But we've had so much success with the simplest ligand that um, we focused right now on just seeing how much we can do with that before moving on to more difficult examples. For example, disubstituted uh, olefins um, and other nucleophiles that may turn out that uh, varying the electronics or the sterics um, so might offer some advantages. Ligand, you, you have ever tried and, uh... Well, we've tried others. They have some different rates, uh, especially the more electron-rich uh, systems. No, sorry, the more electron deficient systems uh, are, are good in certain cases. But um, the results that we have in those are sort of spotty because we've never, if the, if the simple ligand is working, you might, the student will focus on that before developing a new one. Thank you. Ah, I would love to be able to do propargylic alcohols. Uh, they're even simpler to make the, than the allylic alcohols, right? It's the Favorsky reaction. Um, you can take an aldehyde with an acetylene and KOH, and you have a racemic uh, propargylic alcohol, secondary propargylic alcohols. Nobody can do propargylic alcohols. There are some examples in the literature, very limited cases that work very well, but nothing general. So that's a reaction that we identify as a um, high priority. And so whenever we have a new ligand or a new complex, um, we screen the propargylic alcohols. But we have no success um, to report with propargylic alcohols. There's some work involving ruthenium by a Japanese group. Um, and I think it's acetone that's the nucleophile. Uh, and there's some work with copper, I think. Um, but l largely very limited in terms of the kinds of nuclear. So it's a, it's a great reaction to think about, but, um, and we do, but we don't have any good results. Maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there any other questions? Oh, sorry. Uh, first, your name. I have one question. Thank you for great presentation. Uh, and you are? Can, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Okay, Nikolai. Uh, you show in your presentation that uh, iridium work, uh, works well in the reactions, and uh, how about uh, another metals? Huh. Okay. So, um, so first of all, uh, why did we choose iridium? Because it works, right? <laughs> And um, it's the metal that we first started with, and it's easy to handle. It's less expensive than palladium, it turns out. But um, we've had a lot of luck and success, so naturally, we tend to focus on iridium. However, um, there are individuals in my group, master students, uh, starting uh, students, that are tasked to look at things like propargylic alcohols with some new ideas, and to look at other metals. So ruthenium would be particularly interesting. There's some recent work that's uh, appearing with um, allyl alcohols and ruthenium that suggests that we might be able to develop some interesting chemistry out of ruthenium. There's less work involving iron or molybdenum, um, but there are opportunities there as well. 
um, but because there's less work, less precedence, it's more risky. Um, so we try, we do some screening, we have some ideas, uh, we're working on it, but nothing. I hope to have something on ruthenium later this year, but otherwise nothing, um, nothing yet that I can report. Though. But we do look to other metals at this point, including palladium. Huh? So when exploring additional reactions that we might be able to use uh, to carry out uh, with full stereodivergency, we're looking at palladium as well. We, we look at everything. Because I think it would be a mistake to focus too much on what you're comfortable with. I think uh, you can do the best science. Yes, you have an area that you're comfortable with, that you understand, but then take a big leap and get out of your comfort zone and try other things. So we are trying other things. So I, I guess uh, there are no other questions, so let me uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.